everyone, and welcome to another edition of Uniquely Designed. I appreciate you for tuning in. This is my um, pleasure uh, to have you on here, and it is my pleasure today uh, to be talking to not a guest of my podcast, but a friend and a real brother, seriously, and we'll talk more about that um, as it um, we move forward in our particular conversation. Uh, but I'm so happy to welcome, not only is he a podcast host, not only is he a motivational speaker, not only is he a influencer, not only is he a brand consultant, not only is he an entrepreneur, he is a minister, um, not only is he the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity brother, um, which of course I'm sure you felt the brisk chill when you tuned in today. Uh, not only is he that, but he's a great, 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 great person. So I'm so happy to welcome Mark Keith Braden. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. What's going on? Thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm excited. Well, I appreciate you being here because I couldn't, I have thought of anyone that I wanted to talk to more than Mark Keith Braden. Now, um, we go all the way back to... Um, the 1886 days of Kentucky State <laughs> University. Um, and we were, I don't know, I will say this, and you might have a different memory because uh, my memory is, is shifting and evolving. <laughs> but um, I don't remember knowing you before Gospel Ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, but I do remember being in Gospel Ensemble back in the choir rope days. Um in our room there um, in Bradford Hall. Um, and I remember at that time, you know, you were uh, even leading songs, you were singing, all that type of stuff. I don't remember what role you were on. Cause I, you know, I started, I started like on the fifth row. <laughs> like I started <laughs> way in the back. I worked myself up, I worked myself uh, to the front. Uh, but do you remember, you know, those days uh, when we yeah. first, I didn't yeah, you know, it's it's so interesting because uh, prior to Kentucky State, even though I knew I could sing and even though I enjoyed singing, I never sung in the choir prior to Kentucky State. Really? Um, no, never. Never sang in a choir, organized choir prior to Kentucky State University. But usually I was on, I would transition between the second and the first row, depending on how people felt. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was Gospel Ensemble, I'm sure, when we first met. And I think, it, what year did you come to Kentucky State? 98. You came in 98. I think we probably would have met officially in 99 during Gospel Ensemble years. Because okay. 98 was my sophomore, 97, 98 was my sophomore year. So yeah. Okay. So now for those of you who are not choir heads, you wouldn't know why it was important that Marquise was on the first or the second row, um, <laughs> which I do believe works its way into our conversation because mm -hmm. Marquise had visual presentation. To be on the front row or the second row, you had to be visually interesting enough to grab the attention <laughs> of the <laughs> listeners. Because in that day, it was not just sound only, it was right. visual aesthetics, how yeah. you looked how you presented yourself. So if you were on the first and the second row, you have to really be given energy, life, face, and everything. So Marquis, from as long as I remember, I'm talking to y'all and I'm talking to him. He has always, as long as I have known, always been visually together. Always. Just mm -hmm. always presented. So that doesn't, it's not surprising now that you would be a brand consultant because you were always projecting, you know, that type of uh, thing back then. So did you look at yourself as that at that time? Like you just knew that being that you had never been a part of a choir, I would have never known. No. So this is, this is good. This is really good conversation right here because it was coming to Kentucky State University that introduced me to me. That people saw presence in me before I even ever thought of having presence. Uh, I'll never forget. This is a story before coming to Kentucky State. My mother sat me down. Uh, we were in the kitchen. And she just was just talking to me about going to college, going to school. And she said, I want you to understand that, you know, people are going to be attracted to you. And she, she literally said this, both men and women. And I need you to understand that you carry a presence about you that will people will want to be 
in your presence and they'll notice things about you. And when she was talking about it, I'm thinking like, what is this woman talking about? Like, mom, okay, whatever. But it wasn't until I got to K-State, and it was teachers who would tell me this too, but it wasn't until I got to K-State I really began to fully understand what they were saying, but then also I still was insecure around it. So I was carrying it, but yet insecure with it because I'm a, I consider myself to be an ambivert, which I lean more to the introvertedness of my personality, but every gift God has given me forces to me, forces me to be extroverted in the sense of operating in those gifts. What's interesting so, before you move forward is that for yeah. you to say that you were insecure in it, it is interesting the number of people that might be internally insecure, but projecting the opposite. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you would have, when I remember those days, you know, I could have never thought that there was an ounce, you know, because you were, for those who don't know uh, you to that, you know, our Kentucky State days. And for those of you who are hating right now and, and wonder why I talk to so many thoroughbreds is because such greatness came um, from 401, uh, 400 East Main Street, right? Kentucky, <laughs> 40601. Um, but, you know, you also were Mr. Kentucky State University as well. So everything was total opposite of what you might have been feeling or dealing with internally, you know, so that is very surprising to say that you had some levels of insecurity as it relates to that, which is encouragement for those people who um, might be dealing with insecurity that are listening right now. It is insecurity is still not an excuse for you not to find yourself. That's true. That's so true. Yeah. You know, and it was an insecurity in not fully being aware of who I was. That that it took me experiencing people seeing in me what I didn't necessarily see in myself. But then I was willing to press beyond the insecurity or press beyond the fear because there were there were two things that people would always say. They would always say you have a presence about yourself. And when you open your mouth, you make people want to listen, like whether you know what you're about to say or not, there's just something about your voice that makes people pay attention. And I never really fully understood it, but I was willing to explore it, right? I was willing to explore it because before I was Mr. KSU, I was a treasurer of student government who ran against a senior who was running for that office in student government as well and won. And so I'm surprising myself along the way. I'm like, okay, well, I'm willing to press beyond this insecurity or press beyond uh, this lack of confidence that I have just to explore it. And every time I um, surprise myself. That's every cool. time I surprise myself. I even had one of our fellow thoroughbreds. Uh, you know who he is. Uh, a great football player at the time. Uh, he said that he was told that he should have ran for Mr. KSU that year. And he believed that he would have won had he done it. But he convinced himself not to run. And I told him, well, I'm saying, well, I'm convinced that whether you had ran or not, I was going to win regardless <laughs> because history has it that I won. And so it wouldn't have mattered whether or not you had put your name in there. It was so mine good. for the taking. <laughs> so when you say you were surprised, even in those different terms, yeah. were you surprised at yourself that you did it in spite of those things that you were working out in yourself mm. or surprised once again that the things that your mother said were coming to pass and were true? I was surprised that the people voted for me. I was very <laughs> surprised, especially uh, Mr. KSU, because the, there were peers of mine who I was friends with, who I believed were way more popular than I was. Who I believe that people liked more than me, but I still remember to this day that I was, I think, 400 votes more than the person who was runner up. So I was surprised that people actually voted to that degree for me because I didn't necessarily believe that I was that well liked 
because of everything that you just got finished talking about, the presence and people perceived me as arrogant. They would say that all the time. People just perceived me as arrogant without even knowing me, first of all. Um, and I couldn't never fully understood stand that as well. And that has carried. Let me tell you this. You know, and this is me being transparent and vulnerable. This still uh, travels with me today at 45. That people have this perception of me without knowing me. And I have yet to really put my finger on why is that? What is this thing that continues to follow me most of my adult life? where people have this perception of me that's not really me, but they're even unwilling to even try to find out who the real me is. Is the perception based on, um, and of course you don't know the answer to other people's perceptions, but is some of the perception based on, I wonder because there are people who have a level of confidence, even if it's assumed confidence um, and a surety in themselves and their purpose and who, why they're here that sometimes makes other people feel uncomfortable uh, in the sense that they'll assign arrogancy, you know, yeah. because you're confident and why you're here. Do, do you believe that it, some of it might be encouraged in that in some way? Yeah, I think the great majority is that I'm just a person who, who, who grew out of perfection and stepped into excellence. So I'm a person that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it in an mm -hmm. excellent way. And my excellent may look different from yours. It's not that I'm trying to be better or not that I'm trying to uh, stand out. It's just that if I'm going to put my name on it or stand behind it, I need to do it in excellence. And sometimes people's perception of that. Well, I'll tell you what one of my coaches told me that a lot of times what you press forward towards automatically accentuates what other people wanted to do but decided not to. Say that one more time. Believe that when you press forward towards the thing that you know your purpose to do, it automatically accentuates what they wanted to do, but they decided not to do it. And so it becomes intimidating because they wanted to do it too, or they believe they could do it too, but yet they see in you what they saw in themselves and what they were unwilling to actually do what they were unwilling to actually take up on. While at the same time, I also had to recognize that gifts are not just those things that we typically call gifts. Singing, speaking, athletes, um, so on and so forth. The gift of presence was something that I had that I never acknowledged or knew that it was a gift that having presence has opened more doors for me than me ever opening my mouth. Because we live in a world where perception is everything. I just think that that's powerful when you said the presence has opened doors for you that otherwise it couldn't. I believe that because there are so many people who say they want to walk in doors, want to walk in spaces, want to be in spaces, but then you get in those spaces and get in those doors and then they start asking questions like, well, why am I here? I shouldn't be here, you know, this type of stuff, you know, versus the presence of I'm here and I know I'm supposed to be here, even if I haven't figured out why I'm in here, but I'm right. in here, you know, and I have that, <laughs> you know, type of presence that I'm not going to shrink back, um, which is, I think, once again, has followed you for all these years, you know, which I believe be taking it now a little bit forward to your own brand, yeah. uh, maximizing that. How Let me long... go back real not to cut you off. Let me go back just for a second. Here's how I learned that presence was a gift. And it was at Kentucky State University that after I won Mr. KSU, I decided to grow my hair out and get cornrow cornrows. And do you that. know that people were upset with me because they didn't feel like that's what they voted for? That the that that what I presented to them was more king like 
than what I decided to do after I won. That's when I knew that presence and how you present yourself is a gift and that people can care less sometimes about what you say or how you represent or this, that, and the other. Sometimes it's just a matter of how you look. <laughs> and they will vote for you all day long just because you their perception of you is this. And when you change that, that's when sometimes people have a problem. Well, it, you didn't take me back because it was it all a sign. I mean, it's all connected because I want to know when did you even recognize, even before we had the terminology, that even in that time, that you were your own brand? Ooh, that's so good. I think it was it was a lot came from K-State. It's so great. You know, this is such a great conversation because I remember sitting in Bradford for convocation and Patricia McLeod came to speak. And I remember that day saying to myself, I was like, I know I'm in school getting my biology degree, but I want to speak like that lady. Like I want to show up like she showed up on that stage. I'll never forget when she came to speak for convocation. I was like, I want to figure out a way. How can I get paid to do exactly what she did? and be present and just show up and flat foot kill the whole auditorium. That was when the seed was planted that, you know, I want to be a brand, and we didn't have that terminology, but I want to be that type of person that walks in a room, has presence, but then also has the ability to transform minds and shift rooms through the power of my voice. Yeah, yeah, that's powerful thinking. I, what I have often thought of is how there were so many different um, speakers like her, which she is, you know, still at her age, still yeah. she can still come into the room and mm -hmm. never, 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 <laughs> never, 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 never give up. You know, she's still uh, that presence and that force. But I, I think often of and of how many of us were in the same room mm -hmm. but were not inspired in the same way. Yes. You know, of the many different speakers, the many different people that we often took for granted because, you know, you have to pay top dollar to see these people in other organizations and corporations um, right. for uh, presidents and for the faculty and staff to have brought in these type of influencers to impact us and not just to bore us, not just for a class for us to get a grade, uh, but to expose us to greatness on that level. And some of us went right. to sleep, some of us didn't show up. Some of us just was like, what was this? You know, but for you to be sitting in that room and something to go off on you to say, I want that, or I want to be that. Um, do you think that whether her or other people, um, started to impact you in a way that you start to look at yourself differently. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think from that time forward was when I really started to study speakers. The Les Browns, the Willie Jollies, you know, Bishop T.D. Jakes. Like there was something that I was drawn to uh, with those type of speakers because they had the ability to tell story. They had the ability to move people with their words they were readers, you know, they would use words that would force me to go look them up, right? And it was from that moment forward, I knew what I was in school to go do professionally, but I always told myself that if I could ever just be a speaker and create a living and create a business from that, um, that's what I wanted to do, Yeah. I want to ask this to, we're going to eventually leave Kentucky State at some point, but right now we are so much happening there. <laughs> I want to ask you, did or was Kentucky State the place that taught you the resilience that you need for the friction that you might face later? Um, mm. Kentucky State, for me at that time, I was at a... Um, homecoming recently um and we were talking about some of the uh, talent that some people 
think they have now. <laughs> we were, um, I say that respectfully, but I was talking about how in my time, um, mm. you would be booed mm. um, at Kentucky State. Um, it was akin to the Apollo. People would always talk about that. And we would say, if you can survive Kentucky State, you can survive anywhere because there was something about those years that we were there that almost demanded excellence. Mm -hmm. It it we and and I will say that it wasn't even always the professors that demanded it, or maybe they had created that culture that had developed it. But we would challenge each other to say that wasn't your best, or that wasn't good, or you could do better, or you did all right. Those type of things, and we were okay with that. So I said that to say, did that type of friction and or those types of things that you faced there help you when you started launching a business, help you when you started getting, you know, um, nose to other doors that didn't open. Right. For you. Right. Yeah. I think that it's so interesting. The first two and a half years, maybe the first three years, first two and a half years, it was pretty comfortable. Right. You know, I wasn't really trying to do much other than go to class get to know people, you know, gospel ensemble, so on and so forth. But it wasn't until I really started to operate in more of that leadership, student, government role where I started to get, you know, a lot of friction. I tell people this all the time, that, you know, being Mr. Kentucky State was the best year of my college experience and the worst because I got to see the dichotomy of people and I got to understand what it meant to have people to support you from what they believed you were and then to see them not support you once they learned more of who you were. If, if you were friends or courted individuals that they didn't think you should be friends or courting, then now you're no longer in their good graces. <laughs> but if you were friends with the people that they thought you should have been friends with and courting, then you, and so it really helped me to understand that this is not a popularity contest. This is more of you learning how to really uh, manage people and be steadfast in who you are regardless of people. And that's what I learned the greatest lesson. That's when I learned the greatest lesson was when I was with the KSU because there were some things that happened that both devastated me in a way, but then that I also was excited and celebrated about, which has carried on to this day, you know, because I went on to graduate school at Meharry and the same things that were at Kentucky State were the same things in graduate school at Meharry where my peers would always put me up front, president of the graduate school, getting leadership scholarship in the graduate school, which was really very rare because it was very expensive because I was at a med medical school. Um, but those same lessons from Kentucky State I had to carry into Meharry and it's so interesting, and I don't know what your audience looks like, but both were HBCUs and both were dealing with us. <laughs> and so that's a whole nother thing, right? Dealing with us. And so it's not a ha by happenstance, I end up going in ministry in the black church. Most of the corporate organizations in healthcare that I worked for when I was in my career were black underserved organizations. And so it all began to work together and help me to fully understand why I needed to go through the things that I did. What I got from that is that as long as you blended in, you had no, I had no problems. But as soon as you stepped out from among, <laughs> once you stepped out from among, then other people started to uh, sanction you being yeah. out from among and then start to say, oh, yeah, you you come on, you're going to do it. You're going to be the leader or whatever. So would you say as you um, began to start developing and evolving, would you say 
that leadership found you or you found it? I would say I stepped into it. And when you just said what you said, I realized that that has been my life's journey, period. That the reason why I would get into spaces of comfort and assimilate were because as a child, I was always picked on for being different. And so the way this is, and that's where I think some of the insecurity or lack of confidence came in because being different wasn't necessarily the popular thing to be as a child, especially within my family, because everybody played sports, you know, played basketball, played football, ran track. And so I assimilated to the degree that I had some level of athleticism. So I did all of those things. But one of the things that I didn't do, as I shared with you before coming to Kentucky State, I didn't sing in choirs. I didn't do anything that really was outside of what, quote unquote, boys did during my time of growing up in the uh, mid to late 80s, early 90s. Um, So coming to Kentucky State put me three and a half hours away from what I knew. Nobody knew me other Mm -hmm. than my uncle who was a professor there. And I could explore all the things that I wouldn't explore when I was at home. Stepping into um, the role of leadership, the role of an influencer, because leadership is influence, as John Maxwell says, nothing more, nothing less. Um, But to be able to step into the role and to assume the role was, and when you look back, do you feel that even stepping forward or stepping into was almost even being induced to stepping into yourself as well as stepping into moments that needed a leader to rise up? Yes, I I would say yes. I think that for me, stepping into it was embracing me. I'll say it again. Stepping into it really was embracing me. And here's the thing. Even at 45, I'm still stepping into it because still today even in the nashville community people will call me that thing that you just called me as an influencer and in my head i'm like what are you talking about i'm i'm, just, I'm saying this to the people like I, i'm an influencer are you serious like i know people who are real influencers but for whatever reason you know people look to me i was at the barbershop the other day and people were congratulating me because I'm starting a new show that launches today, actually mm-hmm. called The Empower Show. And I was sharing about the experience. And um, the young lady I was talking to, I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't even really know my co-host that well. But she said she agreed to it because she got to learn more about me just by watching me and my consistency. And the, the young lady in the barbershop was like, well, who doesn't know who Markeith is? And in my head, I'm thinking like, there's a whole bunch of people who don't know who I am. I'm just moving in purpose. I'm just doing the things that I have passion for. And and people see me as this person that I don't necessarily see myself as. I'm just operating in purpose. Um, Let me say it again. I'm just operating in purpose and what I'm passionate about. And that's it. Bishop Jakes, uh, as you referenced to earlier, preached a message once called, um, I didn't know I was me. Mm. And how when he looked back, he never knew he was who everybody else saw him as. He was just responding, saying yes to this, moving into that, mm. you know, answering the call to this, a call. And then at some point, looking back, said, I never knew I was me. Um, mm. So I thought that that was really important to identify to those people who are, um, because I believe the word influencer, as we use as a coined phrase now, um, for those who have X amount of followers, right, right, you know, whatever. But I do believe going back to John Maxwell's definition of leadership um, and how it's influenced, um, I believe we're all those who step into it are influencing on whatever level, 
that mm-hmm. is, you know, um, and even if that's still developing and evolving, which I thought was important too, that you just said, even at, at 45, you're still stepping into um, as if some people feel like there is this, and I want you to talk about it. Some people feel like there is a place that you eventually land at and then you just coast the rest of the way. Um, but those of us who are are committed to the to the life of growth realize that there are stages and that you will constantly evolve it choose if you choose to continue to step into that. That's good. That's so true. So true. Yeah, I mean, I'm still stepping into it. There's so many things about my life that I don't really share a lot, um, which may sometimes play into this whole why maybe people have a perception of me being arrogant because I might uh, curate what I like to (laughs) share. But I mean, it's just my personality that, you know, if I don't necessarily feel the um, inspiration to share it, to me, it becomes not important. But I do notice that when I do share certain things, people are always very gracious, right? They are always saying, wow, you know, that really helped. You know, we never knew or or this, that, and the other, which is why I started the new show as well. It gives me an opportunity to let people in more. I mean, because most people probably didn't know what I just shared around about my childhood and why I was this person who was a little bit comfortable and just would rather assimilate than to be different. Well, it all stems back from being, you know, picked on in a sense, uh, as a child, for being different. And so that translates into, I mean, it still translates into your my adult life today that because there's some things I choose not to do because I'm like, I already know what this is going to bring. Yeah. I was so going to ask, really want to do with it? Yeah. are you still unpeeling and unlayering those areas you know, mm-hmm. from childhood? Still today, still today unlayering it um, even my coaches notice it. You know, my coaches notice that I have yet to still fully step into Mark Heath Braden. Okay, hold on. What a hold on. one second. You said your coaches plural, not coach. So let's lean into that for a moment about <laughs> <laughs> the power of mentorship and people. <laughs> they're so loaded. This is such a wonderful conversation. I want to watch it myself. But to be able to recognize that you might be stepping into some areas, but there are people who might have stepped before you or gone into areas and you have to be coached into that. When did you recognize that you needed coaches or what you saw within yourself or started to rise into I started getting coaches about 2013. 2013, I hired my, I had my first coach where I invested in myself. So I think that's key that you're not invested in the coach, you're investing in yourself. So whatever you pay the coach is not for them, it's for you. But I was wanting to really put the meat and potatoes to starting a speaking and consulting business. And so the best way that I learn to get to the from point A to point B is that you find somebody who's doing what you want to do on the level that you want to do it on and you pay them whatever they charge to get the coaching or to get the lesson. And so 2013 was when I first started getting coaching because I was working in a career that I was unfulfilled at. And I just told myself, I cannot go the rest of my life working in a career that just zaps my energy and I'm unfilled at and unfulfilled that. And so I need to pursue the thing that I said I want to do all the way back when I was at Kentucky State University and not knowing that the next year I was going to be laid off my job anyway. So you had a glimpse before you even jumped. Yeah. So you had so coach before you got laid off. I got coaching for about a year prior to being laid off. 
And so when I got laid off, I was not, I wasn't, I didn't feel like, well, what am I going to do? Well, I already knew what I was going to do because I had been getting coaching for about a year prior to being laid off April the 4th of 2014. And I've not um, had a traditional nine to five job since 2014. 2013, when you reached out for counseling, and I just want to make this practical for anybody who might be at that stage that you are at saying, I see myself in a place, I'm feeling myself pulled to a place. I don't know how to be or operate in that place. I don't know what that looks like, but I do need a mentor, but I don't know who that is or where to find that. And what once, because a lot of times when you say there's mentorship needed or coaching needed, what does even one say to someone who wants to be a coach? Take me back to that. Just like, what did you even say? Did you know what to say or ask? No, I didn't necessarily know what to say, but I think this is where you get to where you you have to have the right friends around you. You know, sometimes we we you hear a message where some people say keep your vision to yourself <laughs> and and just do the thing and then share after you've hit success. Well, I think that's one way, but then there's another way where you you surround yourself with people of like-mindedness and you share that vision with people because you don't know if they have a connection to somebody who can help you and so that's what happened for me was that i was sharing with my friend that i really want to launch this speaking in consulting business and one of my friends knew of this particular coach they was like well this coach does this full-time this is her business she works uh, for the tsu incubation center but she also does business coaching And she was a life coach as well. And so I hired her. And I'll never forget, it was the first time that I was willing to pay somebody, I think it was $350 a month, to help me with the formation of the business. So it was through a friend who was of like-mindedness, who was also an entrepreneur, who referred me to this coach. Okay, so... There's so many things that I would love to get into, but for the sake of time. <laughs> so there was a friend who connected you to a life coach or a business consultant. Not just any type of friend. Well, I know it was a. Because I couldn't have asked. I, I don't think I could have asked another nine to five. Mm, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Friend. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah, I got right. that. That's good. But I wanted to ask this really important question or this really important. I want to land on this particular thing. So once you identify, I need coaching. I need to, I'm stepping into a place. I know that I can't stay here at this nine to five. This is not for me. Didn't know I'm going to get laid off, but the next year, but this is, I'm at a place that I cannot scratch this itch that I have. I need someone to do it. Then this friend who is not a nine to fiver, then connected you to someone um, or, you know, suggested someone to reach out to them. This is what they do. Where in yourself were you so ready to leap into this that you didn't even mind the pay part? Because there are many people who are itching (laughs) and need to be scratched whatever that is that that enter entrepreneurial era, the, the, whatever but that investment piece is where mm-hmm. some people pause and like well, I don't know about that what in you at that time and still now because you still have coaches uh, that you're still investing not just investing in others but you're investing in yourself what part of you was it when you said going back to the Patricia Russell McLeod that you said I want to be that and to get there I'm willing to invest whatever it takes to get there. What is it that, what was that mentality like, mindset like for you at that time? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree with you just a little bit because I'm about to give you a scenario or a story. Have you ever had a toothache? I'm asking you, Mario. Have oh, you yeah. ever had a toothache? No, I thought you just I'm saying a rhetorical yes. question. Yes. No, you've had a toothache. And has it ever been so bad that you had to go to the dentist and no matter what it costs, you just wanted it out? Mm-hmm. 
The yeah. reason why most people won't invest is because they're not in enough pain. I was in enough pain in that job that I was willing to do whatever it took to make sure that I got out of that pain. So let me say this. So mind you, I'm an advocate and a proponent, so you didn't disagree with me at all. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm being the devil's advocate. I'm just asking the questions for those people who, you know, I know what desperation sounds like and what it looks like. You know, I know that. But just for those people who do have the toothache, there are some people who have the toothache or anything, and some people will ignore it, try to numb it, try to do different over-the-counter things. But there was something in you that said, this is not for me. You know, yeah. that's really what I was, you know, getting. I got at. you. I got you. Fully understand. Yeah, I think the pain was one. But then the thing was, was that I knew I was out of alignment. That I would go in my office. And, the, and, and granted, you know, this was 2010 to 2014. I was, I, I had four jobs. I started my professional career. In 2004, after I graduated with my hearing. So between 2004 and 2010, I think I worked for four different organizations. One being an educator, teaching school. And I went from teaching school in 2010 back into healthcare and got a $50,000 raise from being a teacher going back into health administration. And I would go in that office. I had got the corner office, had the windows, had a door, <laughs> all the things that they say you're supposed to be striving for. But I would look out that window every single day and say, God, there has to be more to my life than this. I have the benefits. I have the salary. I'm driving the infinity. I purchased my first home when I was 26 years old. It's got to be more to this. I was fully out of alignment. And I'll never forget, I heard Les Brown say this. He said, if you go to a job five days a week and at least two or three of those days you are wondering why you're there or you're complaining about why you're working there, it's time for you to be to evaluate what you should be doing. That you get to order something new, you're just choosing not to. That when we go to a restaurant, we look at the menu and we choose what it is that we want to eat. But when we get to our life, we just accept whatever is brought to us when you get to choose. And yes, I know some people have families, they have kids, they have all these things that they have to pay, you know, take care of and be responsible for. But at, at the end of the day, which I don't like that phrase, but at the end of the day, you still get to choose whether or not you are in alignment and this is what it is that you want to do so i started reading books i got a coach i started following certain people online that were doing what i wanted to do on the level that i wanted to do it on and i just knew that i could not go 10 more years doing this thing there was no way i could do it no way I believe that this whole entire podcast is called You Get to Choose. Because um, when you said that, I just I said, Ooh. <laughs> because you do get to choose, you know, not just talking about menus and stuff, but your everything that you've been saying, everything from, you know, Kentucky State to your job to Harry to now, it's been a series of choices. Choices, yeah. And I'm at a point in my life where I have to make it. I'm at another point, pivotal point in my life where I have to make a choice. Right? Because as I've shared several times, you know, I'm 45 and there is this place of comfort that I'm in. That how do I go to my next level? What most people would say. Well, I mean, you work for yourself, you, you travel, you, you have your own home, you 
make great money. What else do you want? And I'm like, this is not it. Like, am I too comfortable now that I need to choose something else that's going to stretch me out of this comfort zone that I'm in? And when did you start identifying that? That I'm like, all right, I think I've gotten comfortable. I don't need to stay here. When uh, my income statement would be the same year after year. So when I would I would set an income goal and not hit the income goal, but it would still be close to the same as the year before and the year before that. And the year before that, speaking of my business. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, OK, it's time for me to choose something different. Like I'm I'm not stretching myself enough or I'm not around the right people. That will stretch me to go beyond what I have become comfortable with. But that hinges also with your um, brand name. Uh, which maximize um, your brand. Hope I said that right. Uh, yeah. Which goes to maximizing yourself. Yeah. Um, first, what caused you to land on just even that name? Um, I took a, it's a, and I think I came up with the name before I took the assessment. It's called the Kobe, K-O-L-B-E. And it is a, an assessment that you can take that, shares with you how you show up or what is your most natural inclination of action. And for me, my number one in that assessment was maximizer, that I have the innate intuitiveness that when I see something, I'm always thinking how you can make it better. Always. That I don't necessarily have the creative ability to pull something out of thin air and create it but once something exists you know this plant-based protein i'm i'm going to automatically start thinking okay it's good but how can we get 42 grams of protein instead of 32 grams of protein in this so as a maximizer i'm always figuring out or thinking about how do i make something better and when i thought about the name of the podcast and what I wanted my brand to represent maximize your brand was so important to me because it was exactly what I needed to do in order to be seen, be heard. So I could get paid that if I didn't believe in myself and if I didn't exploit the gifts that I had, then I couldn't really build a business. And at the end of the day, people can care less about your service, your product and what you have to offer. People buy into people first before they buy your product. So how do I make myself big enough to where people would trust me to buy from me, hire me Mm. as a speaker, hire me as a coach or consultant? Mm. Yeah. You said people buy into people, lean into that, you know, what, what, even what that means. Yeah. I believe that your personal brand is your greatest selling point. That, the more you put into yourself, the more you um, learn about who you are and how you show up in the world, the more you are aligned, the more you align with the people who want what you have to offer. That before they see your product or service, they're analyzing you. That they can tell within the first three to five minutes whether or not you're confident and what it is that you're doing. And if you're not confident in what it is that you're doing, they're not gonna be confident in what it is that you have to offer. So the idea of personal branding to me is self-development. That it's personal branding is self-awareness. Personal branding is really alignment with purpose because you want to brand, you want to be the brand of what you're called to do. I believe I'm called to to help people not find their purpose, but to unearth the thing that they buried for so long and then step into it and then create a business from it. How do I unearth, dig up all the stuff that I buried 
it under. Now that I've uncovered it, how do I now align with it so that I can leverage it to create the lifestyle that I want? I want to ask this, um, like we kind of teetered on it, but not really gone into it. Would you say that even though this is, you know, consulting, influencing, leadership, um, branding, et cetera, would you say that you would still view much of what you do in alignment with your ministry, um, with a, that is your call, you know, would you, would you, uh, even attach that to what it is that you do? It is my ministry. Um, what we didn't share was from 2015 to 2018, 2014 to 2018, I was in full-time ministry at my local church here in Nashville while I was building the business. And while at that church, um, I had the ability to be the maximizer as the minister of communications and marketing. Before I came to the church, the church didn't have an app, was not live streaming, um, had stopped their ongoing um, news newsletter, wasn't frequently emailing uh, their people and wasn't necessarily collecting uh, tithes and offerings virtually. From the span of 2015 to 2018, I instituted the church app. I instituted online giving. I instituted text to give. I instituted live streaming and played a very pivotal role in choosing technology to help run all of that. And so by the time I left in 2018, we were well prepared for COVID. And so I was learning how to run my business at the same time operating in my ministry space of maximizing ministry where I was, while at the same time, teaching, preaching, Bible study, so on and so forth. But when it came to 2018, I felt the release that the ministry God gave me was more toward the marketplace than it was within um, parish ministry. Did you have those terms, um, that type of understanding of the difference um, before you stepped out or was that something, and I, I'm asking that in more of a yeah. traditional sense, that oftentimes you're not sometimes hearing people say, you know, some of you are not going to be in here. Some of you are not called here. Some of you be called outside of here. Do you think that you just started to evolve into that place of understanding? This is not my lanes, not necessarily in here. Yeah, it was an evolution. It was evolution over the over those four years. But it was also a practicing ground because a pastor allowed me, I remember doing a three day, um, well, we don't, we didn't have Bible study during the month of July. So pastor allowed me to do what I called a shift your life workshops during the month of July. And it was so surprising that, that the room that we were using will be filled every Wednesday night. Because so many people were ready to shift their life into the thing that they really believed they were called to do. But we just so accustomed. We go to work, work to nine to five, you know, and wake up every morning and do it all over again. And here I came with a new message. But to kind of go back to what we talked about earlier, the I got a lot of kickback from other people pastors and ministers in the church because why did pastor let him do this when I've had ideas to do certain things but pastor didn't allow me I can't explain that to you all I know was that he saw enough in the vision that I had and what I had put together that he allowed me to do it hmm. but because of my experience of leadership and dealing with people along the way i was ready for that right yeah yeah i want to um because we could talk about this forever this is first of all thank you for your transparency that you've been sharing um i want to go back to we had a fraternity brother um mm. uh, by the name of james stowe yeah. who passed away 
um, you know, also Kentucky State alum, um, years ago, um, suddenly. What has it felt like for you to have, well, let me say it a different way. Do you feel that some of your, even your shifting that you're in now, shifting your life, you know, really making another choice, is it also aligned with understanding the brevity of life and mm. how you have only so much time and so much, so much space um, that you have allotted to do what it is that you know you're called to do in the time span that you're in? Because when that happened, uh, for me, that was another shifting place for me that I've made some decisions, um, but it really, and we've had other people that have passed away, but when sometimes someone close to you around the same age and you'd be like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, we don't have a long time, you know, to be doing what it is that we're called to do. So have there been moments like that and others that have kind of reset you and be like, wait a minute, I really need to do what I'm called to do now. Yeah, I think for a lot of people, those type of moments kind of jolts you, right? And for me, uh, losing James was one of those moments where, because we ta- we both had this interest in um, being motivational speakers and you know inspiring people to to live their best life. And at the same time, I think we both were on this journey of ministry, uh, starting around the same time too, and. It's something about when you lose somebody that close, you do start thinking about like, wow, you know, it, it could have been me, right? And you start to think about what are all the things mm-hmm. that he and I talked about that I've yet to move on, that I've yet to take action on, that he would want me to take action on or that he would have encouraged me to ask me, well, why, why haven't you moved forward on it? And so, yes, you know, moments like that. And I've had other moments where I had a friend who was younger than me, a couple of years younger than me, uh, who passed of a heart attack. And it was just another one of those moments where you're like, you know, this life is short. Yeah. You know, and this life is something that you need, which is why I do some of the things I do. I work out Monday through Saturday, just about, and changed my eating habits and, you know, pursuing the things that if it comes to mind and I have a vision for it, go for it. Because I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And doing all the things that I know to do to be healthy, you still don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had um, I had friends one time that I was talking about, you know, the brevity of life and not trying to make this a solemn conversation, but, you know, the brevity of life and stuff like, you know, I just, you know, for those people who you say, you know, you're doing too much. I'm like, I don't feel like I'm doing enough. Like, I don't want to. I want to, you know, when it says over in Genesis, it says so and so died and they lived a hundred. So and so then they die full of life. When I hear the word full of life, what it means is they died still full of other things that they could have done. Like they were, you know, like still full of ideas, still full of things and purpose and whatever. And um, when you think of, you know, Cicely Tyson, who wrote a book, you know, and uh, released it. And then I think Lenny Kravitz said about her, her passing, he said, it would just be like her to write a memoir and say, all right, y'all read it. I'm gone. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) You know, Uh, but for you to never get to a point that you're saying, I'm, I'm retiring, I'm done. You know, you can't right. retire on yourself. Like there's, you right. know, Eric Thomas, um, E.T. wrote a book called You Owe You. You know, if you owe it to yourself, you know, to um, to rise up and to step into all the versions of yourself that are possible. So, um, you know, thank you for your example, you know, what you're doing, you know, with not just working out and being healthy, you know, but maximizing yourself, stepping into your assignment, and all that type of stuff. So I wanted to ask you, would you speak to those that are listening who might be on the nine to five, who might be um, still dealing with some of the childhood layers of themselves that they haven't put off, but are still feeling um, are sometimes even thrust into positions that they are like, I don't know if I'm ready yet. Uh, speak to them um, as to what um, is needed for them now. Yeah. 
Here's what I'll say, you know, the my business was founded on this one quote and it jolted me. And every time I say it, it jolts people. It was from the late Dr. Miles Monroe. It says that the greatest failure in life is to be successful at the wrong assignment. And so the question that I have for those of you who are listening is that are you being successful at the thing that you know God has called you to? And if you're not, are you willing to take the steps in order to realize true success, which is the fulfillment of purpose? That what is your purpose? What is the thing that you know in your heart of hearts you're called to do? And if you haven't found yourself doing it, now is the time for you to start evaluating your relationships and your surroundings. Because I believe that the first step to really fully getting into that place is that you have to find yourself in the right ground in order to grow, in order to get the nourishment and the fertilization in order to grow. And it may seem like it might take a long time to get there, but if you never place yourself in the environment, you'll never get there. You'll never get there. And so it's your time. It's your season. It's your moment. And this too shall pass wherever you're at. And I don't want you to be like me having to be laid off to go. Right. You can start now with your employer as your number one investor. And in investing yourself by getting a coach, taking a course or what have you, that's in the direction that you're wanting to go in so that you get to the point where you can tell the job don't need you anymore. Thank you for investing in my future. I'm going to pursue it now. That's good. That's very, very good. Basically, uh, when you identify that you're really in enough pain, go to the dentist, <laughs> get what you need, <laughs> get what you got to do. Well, let people know where they can follow you, how they can follow you, um, you know, all the places and spots that you're at because you don't consider yourself an influencer, you know. So please let people know all the places <laughs> they can follow you at so that they can be influenced and uh, maximize their own brand. Yeah, you can follow me on all of the social media channels, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or LinkedIn, at Markeith Braden, M-A-R-K-E-I-T-H-B-R-A-D-E-N. Also, I am the host uh, of two now podcasts, uh, the Maximize Your Brand podcast, which is all about teaching really high-achieving corporate professionals how to transition from their corporate jobs into a career as a speaker, coach, or consultant. And then the Empower Show is what I'm launching as of October the 17th, uh, just to help you get unstuck so that you can get to the place that you want to go. And so both of those are on YouTube. You can search the Empower Show on YouTube, or you can search on your platforms of podcasting, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, maximize your brand with Marquis Brayton. Yeah. Well, I want you all to do yourself a favor and um, go to this dentist because you know you <laughs> you got to do. Follow him. That will be one of your first investments of many investments. Um, and I promise you, as we just had this conversation at some point, you'll thank yourself that you took that leap and you did what you were needed to do. And as always, thank you for tuning in. Please share this with your friends. Please make sure that they uh, find out um, this information and never forget to embrace your own unique design. Bye.